Welcome to Cynical Celluloid, where the nuns have no guns but want priestly buns. This episode we're turning towards a film that's often described as the most controversial of all time. One where the crosses were both of the crucifix kind and across the red lines. Writhing nuns and corrupt Catholics conspire against a sinful holy man, all while Ludon collapses around him, in Ken Russell's notorious historical drama, The Devils. Father Grandier, a lustful, sinful but popular priest who finds himself in the charge of the city of Loudon after the death of the governor, finds himself facing off against the king's men, as they attempt to tear down the defensive walls in order to make it vulnerable to invasion. Having successfully repelled them, he finds the church, led by Cardinal Richelieu, plotting to consolidate power with the king by handing Loudon over to him. The problem being that they would have to take Grandier down to achieve it. Meanwhile, in the local convent, the hunchback Mother Superior Jeanne de Agne harbours fiery sexual desires for Grandier, and her heightened sexual frenzy catches the church's attention as a potential weapon against him. Having threatened and manipulated the sisters of the convent, in particular the mentally fractured Jeanne, who's deeply upset at Grandier's marriage, the church creates the case against him, while the convent melts down in an increasingly orgiastic show of madness, and the church begins to claim mass possession, which they blame on Grandier. Through means of torture, humiliation and a show trial, the church aims to bring down Grandier and destroy his reputation. But can they truly break him? Who is responsible for this evil possession, Sister Jeanne of the Angels? A priest? A priest? What church? St. Peter's. St. Peter's. Tell his name. Grandier. It hardly needs to be said how controversial Ken Russell's masterpiece The Devil is. Blighted by censorship, including by the studio that made it, it's a film that has been through the mill, almost to the extent of Grandier himself. Well, at least in the artistic sense. Does it deserve such infamy? Well kind of depends where you're coming from. Russell himself, having been Catholic since the 50s, made The Devils based on an infamous story, and more specifically, the account written by Aldous Huxley. And it's a deeply potent, quite disturbing portrayal of corruption of abuse of power, most significantly by the church. That in its own right, let alone the depiction of sexual frenzy and graphic violence, was a recipe for provoking the religiously sensitive Though it has to be said, it should have been obvious that they were stepping into a world of censorious conflict from the start. What should be made clear for those who aren't familiar with the story of the Devils of Loudan is that it is a true story. In the mid-1600s, there was a real Father Grandier who burnt at the stake, having been accused of witchcraft. This is one of those cases where the this story is true card is actually not fibbing. It's worth looking at a bit of the history before going into the film as it informs where Russell is coming from. The 17th century was not a very secular time in the world, obviously. European monarchies were more often than not being manipulated by the Catholic Church. Being the most powerful religious organisation around, it was very active in political affairs, consolidating power through the ruling classes by various means, often somewhat nefariously. After all, they had just lost England in the previous century thanks to King Henry VIII, and they were very, very keen on making sure they didn't lose control of more countries. France, under King Louis XIII, was a strongly Catholic state by force, and Cardinal Richelieu had the king's ear as his principal minister. He was not immune from criticism, though, and instability, any instability in his influence over the king, would not be tolerated. Since the Reformation in the 1500s, in particular the long and developing split that had created the Protestant movement, had divided the church on a fundamental level. Criticism of the church's power, more specifically the abuse of power, had grown unbearable by the church. Concerns on the church's demands of payments from the state and their outsized and unaccountable levels of influence within the ruling class was finally seeing a serious rift grow in the 1600s all against the background of war in Europe. Richelieu was not about to settle for a lot of power, though. Seeking to centralise power in France, he ordered the destruction of all but the most vital fortifications of France in order to render any dissenters less able to defend themselves. But this met with some resistance due to the split of the church. 
The Protestant movement obviously meant that there were a significant number of citizens who were now not bound by the word of the Pope, and this meant that the expectation that you do as the Pope says held increasingly less sway. And the Huguenots, one of the most significant dissenters from the Catholic Church in France, also had the military power with which to resist. Into this fractious time came a priest, Urbain Grandier, a self-described secular priest, and for those confused by the idea of a secular priest, it really meant that he would tend to Catholic or Protestant citizens regardless. Grandier had a history with Richelieu. They were quite antagonistic towards each other previous to the events of Loudon. For one thing, Grandier was fiercely critical of Richelieu, even quite mocking on several occasions, and that wouldn't do in those days. For another, Grandier was an opponent of the policy of chastity for priests, something that would lead him to making enemies for himself by opening up avenues of true and sometimes purely political tax on his integrity. While Richelieu's men turned up at Loudon to turn down the wall, Grandier, using all his political wiles, forced the men to stop the destruction based on the king's word that Loudon would not be touched. Meanwhile, at the local nunnery, the mother superior, Jeanne d'Agne, having been turned down on a rough for Grandier to be their confessor, and also because she'd reportedly become somewhat fixated on him sexually, began to accuse Grandier of using witchcraft to seduce her, and soon the other nuns joined in. There are a number of things likely going on here, general mass hysteria exacerbated by the convent's lockdown during the plague outbreak, possibly a form of protest under the guise of possession, after all they could do whatever they wanted and claim to be innocent to the church after, and a good old-fashioned faked Me Too moment, initiated out of malice by the Mother Superior. There's a reason why I always say this shit ain't new. There are a number of speculations on the nuns' involvements. It's a case of picking out the most likely from the mists of time to an extent. So Richelieu ended up using the possessions as uh, ultimate evidence against Grandier, though a number of other factors did weigh in, not least Grandier's relationship with his student, the daughter of an old friend of Richelieu and the king's prosecutor at the time. Talk about unsafe sex. Well, of course, he got her pregnant, and after finding out, realising his life, reputation and career would be destroyed, he immediately walked away. He was soon arrested, and during a curiously locked down trial, during which Grandier was hideously tortured and humiliated, signed documents were introduced that purportedly demonstrated that he'd made a deal with the devil. Known as the Diabolical Pact, it had gained some notoriety and use in some alternative religious groups, Though these documents were, in my opinion, likely outright faked, and either signed by Grandier under duress or simply had his signature forged. I'm fairly certain of the latter. I say this simply because the kind of trial conducted, the methods used in the Catholic Church's historical form on such matters, really makes it far more likely, especially when Grandier is on record as never having made a confession, even as he burned on what was either a maliciously botched execution or utter incompetence. The church carried on after the affair and, despite the Catholic Reformation, never really quite got their shit together to this very day. Grandier, however, stands an example of the consequences of corruption at the highest order, a martyr to the church's brutality. It's kind of heavy, huh? And such is the story of the Devils of Loudon, which most famously found its voice in Aldous Huxley's non-fiction book of that title. Ken Russell would come to it after his 1969 film Women in Love, suggested to him by United Artists, who then passed on it after having seen the screenplay. They're not quite sure what they were expecting from this. The screenplay then passed on to Warner Brothers, who, as we shall see, probably should have passed on it as well. The Devils is a deliriously angry film. Right from the outset, it lays out its mission. With a somewhat extravagant opening to King Louis XIII's production of The Birth of Venus, a reluctantly present Cardinal Richelieu congratulates the king on his performance and without pause inserts this piece of emotional blackmail. I pray that I may assist you in the birth of a new France, where church and state are one, and may the Protestant be driven from the land. <laughs> 
Kent Russell's faith, or rather his shifting thoughts and feelings on it and the church, was one of those things that coloured his art. While always being somewhat irreverent with the subject matter, at least by the standards of one you would expect from a devout or practising Catholic, you can easily see a shift in his attitude uh, to the church throughout his work. The Devils is really the most dramatic shift example of this, being as it's a no-holds-bar attack on the brutal face of the church's history. The story of Grandier is not exactly unique, but it is small enough and encapsulated enough that one might say it is a particularly illustrative and focused example to put forward. If there's one thing that is common with many of Ken Russell's films, it's a sense of the heightened reality, and with The Devils this is most certainly present. Where Huxley's book is a relatively straight-laced thing in how it presents itself, Russell taps into a sense of hysteria. The set designed by Derek Jarman immediately throws the entire film into a strange place, something that is kind of like a life-sized theatre set. From the stage of King Louis XIII to the streets of Loudun, and on to the House of Madness it is the convent, it's all just that bit odd with that heavy use of white brick or tile and black mortar. It's quite sublime and very weird. Russell took the writing of Huxley and injected a strong sense of indignation and outrage into the story. Very efficiently, he encapsulates the most important aspects of the story. It's one of those things that the film does justice to the actual history, whilst harbouring a strong artistic bent as well. Certainly, it isn't a dispassionate or objective historical document, it just isn't that dry. Quite the contrary, in fact. While I have nodded towards the sense of hysteria that the film conveys, it's kind of important to qualify the kind of hysteria that it is, and for this, we have to turn to the nuns. In the historical event, it's more important to note a few things. Firstly, Sister Jeanne is reported to have been obsessed with Grandier, and when he turned down her invitation to be involved with the convent, she was extremely upset. It was at this point that she began to accuse him through her performative possessions, likely fuelled by her fractured mental state and apparent sexual frustration. Then there's the church's representatives who frankly went in and made a lot of stuff happen. Threats, abuse, torture, any physical conversion they could get their hands on, likely played a part in encouraging the nuns to play their roles for the intended audience. And it's worth noting, of course, that they were already in a fragile condition, considering the rampaging plague that forced them into isolation behind the convent walls for some time before the events of the possessions. Grandier himself was notable for his stance on celibacy. He was strongly against it. Of all the documents held up against him, his treatise on the subject was one of the few things that he actually did confess to, and frankly, he also made some powerful enemies with his conquests. So, sex played a large part in the historical story, but Russell really shoves the camera right in there. Literally. The Devil's Bays in a sadistic sexual fervour. It's obviously directed at the church's behaviour primarily, filtered through the psyche of Sister Jeanne. It uses something that the church all too often decries as a weapon against it. Ken Russell was obviously aware of this. He literally has the nuns climbing up the walls for a glimpse of their notoriously sexual grandeur. And the Inquisition against him conduct their work with a frustrated masturbatory zeal. It's things like this, the use of sacrilegious imagery, the Catholic taboos that really rings of Russell's intentional pushing of the buttons but he barely strays from Huxley's account. As theatrical as it gets in tone, when Russell says it's an historical film, he's not lying, though with some minor caveats. The source material is arguably somewhat less than neutral, and the main indulgence on Russell's behalf is really just streamlining the story in a few ways and bringing his own brand of madness to the proceedings. It's not unfair, I think, to point out that this story has its bias. Of course it does and it's that of being fiercely critical of the church and the antagonistic characters involved in the events. And if there's a failing to the story, at least in regards to Russell's adaptation, it's that it's very specifically angled and narrowly cut slice of history. While the wider picture could hardly acquit the antagonists of wrongdoing by any means, there were the usual complications that national and international geopolitics created in a tumultuous time, which informed some of the key actions from them. 
Russell's work doesn't really make much of a nod to any of that, choosing instead to focus on a micro rather than a macro level, leaving the audience to figure out the rest. While this is understandable, after all it's a feature film and not a documentary series, it does dispense with the context that would make the antagonists anything more than the monsters that they're presented as. It's history told in short form with a strong bias towards one of the characters and against all of the others. Not that that makes it illegitimate, but it's worth keeping in mind. As with all films that come with claims of historicity, I always decry inaccuracies or deception where it's intended to manipulate the audience, and it's probably fair to say that there is an agenda here, though I can't help but feel it's all in good faith, so to speak. The devil's deviations and biases, some more significant than others, do carry it away from being a pure historical account. It's clear that Russell had a personal point to make, so take it to be biased in history but coloured with a heavy dose of personal beef. I don't disagree with the beef, but I do acknowledge its effect. As it is, The Devil's is uh, somewhat less about Grandia than it is about how he was treated by the church. And this is where the point of the movie actually lays, in criticism of the Catholic Church's methods of exercising and maintaining power. I say this partly because the lack of context in the film has in regard to Grandier's history prior to the Loudon incident, particularly with his relationship with Richelieu, but also because of how it frames the powers that be. Like I alluded to earlier, it's a close-up of a much wider picture, and considering this, I'm more willing to forgive the license that Russell takes with certain elements of the story, in relation to the actual history, that is. The Devils is a powerful film nonetheless, as angry as it is pointed. It's also a work of art. From the inspired casting in the lead roles with Oliver Reed and Vanessa Redgrave as Grandia and Jeanne, respectively, through to the spectacularly evil turns by Dudley Sutton and Michael Gotthard, along with the regulars that Russell would often use. It's a hugely colourful cast that's more than capable of climbing the dizzy heights to which Russell would set, and that's one of the more appreciable aspects of this film. It's all turned up to a ludicrous volume. I don't mean to say anything bad about the film by this though. The Devils is a film that assuredly cranks up the contrast and yells in your face. After all, one of the most controversial scenes that remains cut is called The Rape of Christ, and it features a lot of naked nuns getting frisky with a statue of Jesus Christ. Couple this with Jan masturbating with grandiose bone. Not a euphemism. You may be able to appreciate that why some were a bit queasy about what this film was. It's all quite overwhelming, what with the grand set design, the cinematography which often resembles, at least to me, the formality of a renaissance painting, and then there's that soundtrack. It rudely cuts through your brain at just the right moment with blaring horns and discordant tones. It's a manic and frenzied orgasm in musical form. And the film suffered because of this to some degree. It's easy to see why anyone, in particular the censors, would feel like it's trying to be shocking. Because the film is most definitely shocking. Especially for the time. And though I, while I'm not entirely convinced that Russell wasn't having some fun poking a few buttons, I don't feel that it was in any way invalid considering the subject matter. For me, Russell hits the emotional tone of the events perfectly. I all too often talk of the psychological take of such stories, and The Devils really goes right in there. Though here, it's not just the madness of one, but the madness of many. And one of the things that's most interesting to me as an aspect of the story is that Grandier isn't presented as being without his faults. His treatment of Philippe, for one, shows him as a man who struggles to deal with the consequence of his own actions, as he callously throws her to the curb, after finding out that she's pregnant by him. It's not really as clear in the film as it is from other sources, but it was seemingly a decision born of self-preservation as much as it was to do with his personal feelings for the girl. Not that that makes it much better. His other beau, in the form of Madeleine, fares much better at his hand, and as Huxley describes, was an object of some affection for Grandier. This said Grandier is presented as a man of the utmost integrity when it comes to the city and its people. What the Devils is, at least to me, is an energetic haymaker thrown at political and ideological power. It's often a cliché to say that some works of art are more relevant now than they have been before, 
With the Devils, it's certainly a story that has a lot of points that can be applied to current political and ideological issues and practices. As I've pointed out in other film works that touch upon these things, Men Behind the Sun particularly comes to mind amongst others, history is something that should always be looked to for lessons for the future. As surely as The Devils of Ludon had its place in history, it should not be confined to dusty old books and forgotten. It also contains lessons of things to look out for right now, and of course, in the future. As an example, and not to get overly politically provocative towards my American friends, it bears worth pointing out some of the political figures of your own recent political history. When significant and aggressive political voices are claiming religious mandates and bizarrely fantastical stories work their way into and in opposition to governance, then it's worth keeping one eye open when you sleep. Because like Grandier, you'll end up with trumped up charges and accusations of consorting with Satan. And I say that with barely any exaggeration. Of course, it isn't all a uniquely US issue, unfortunately. You guys just make it far easier to see. That's why for me The Devil's is and always was a powerful story. The things it talks about are seemingly something we're always cursed to live with and while it carries a lot of bad news in that respect, it also does carry the hope of characters like Grandier who, even as the outliers, can cause serious damage to the powers who choose to abuse those they lord over. As something of a coda to this video, I thought I'd discuss the censorship that The Devils has endured. As I said earlier, it was a project that was passed on by the very studio that suggested it, before Warner Brothers picked it up. When presented with the film, Warner Brothers then had second thoughts about what Ken Russell had created and began reaching for the scissors themselves. Now the details are a little murky, but it seems that the film was first submitted to the BBFC, who, in conjunction with Warner Brothers, drew up lists of required cuts and, in a shocking example of collusion, mutually agreed to request each other's cuts, those ones that had not been made on their own respective lists. The most obvious cut was the Rape of Christ scene, but along with that went Gian's inventive use of Grandier's charred bone, and numerous cuts to the nun orgies, according to the BBFC, to reduce the explicitness and duration of certain sexual elements, and to reduce the scene of Grandier being tortured. Considering some of these were pivotal scenes in the film, Ken Russell was obviously upset at this, and a now infamous set of exchanges went back and forth between the BBFC and the director until Russell had the backing of one of his supporters at the BBFC, Lord Harlech. Russell describes in these exchanges reducing certain contentious shots, such as cleaning up the shit on the altar, and so on. Harlech was sympathetic to Russell, but with plenty of pressure going on in the background, including having Mary Whitehouse causing a lot of trouble over several decisions the BBFC had made, and poor Stephen Murphy was left with this on his desk at the start of his tenure, while some of the examiners were also having their own problems with the film, such as the politics of film censorship, especially when the country still had enforceable blasphemy laws. The result was an 111 minute cut, which, in a twist for most who think that the BPFC would be the ultimate in prudishness, was further cut by Warner Brothers by about another 6 minutes, according to the BBFC. This was to reduce nudity in the USA release, which was to allow the film to be shown in a suitable number of cinemas. This heavily censored R-rated version was later the version that was released on VHS. <laughs> 
The reduction of the torture scene in particular highlighted the dangers of censorship. Just as Amy's double rape being reduced in Straw Dogs actually made it appear much more like what the BBSC feared it was, i.e. buggery, the reduction of Grandier's ordeal made it look far worse and even suggested that it was in fact Grandier's testicles being crushed by the hammer. After reducing the scene almost frame by frame in several attempts, in a desperate attempt to make it less shocking, the censor scissors actually made the horrific scene something more visceral, at least to any guys in the screening. The specifics of the cuts aside, this was censorship of the most aggressive kind. Warner Brothers has the source material in their vaults, and it took film critic Mark Kermode leading a campaign and then going to the vaults to find the material to finally prove that the footage still existed. From that material, he and others put together something resembling the original director's vision, which he then showed to Russell in a private screening. Warner are, to this day, the only barrier to a release of the full film, but they're still sitting on it, still bullishly refusing the film a chance to see the light of day, save for a handful of limited screenings. At present, in the UK, the only version available on home media is the original X-rated UK cut, which does not restore the original Warner and BBFC cut material. Will we ever see the original version? Well, it does, like I say, still exist, so there's always a chance. Should Warner ever get past its squeamishness about the movie, then maybe one day. At present, it's my opinion that the religious climate in North America means it remains a tricky prospect, though there would be much less reason not to in the UK and Europe. There have been and continue to be these occasional limited screenings which indicate some willingness to preserve the film and allow it to be seen, so that is a sign of hope. Given the regard the film has, along with the many examples of other films with far more graphic sexual content these days, there seems far less reason to continue to sit on the film. Sure, if it was released even now, it would still get some blowback, but times have changed at least enough on this side of the pond for the full force of Russell's vision to be unleashed. And given the times that we live in, especially in regard to the lessons that the story has to teach, I think it's high time that Warner's put this important film where it belongs, in front of an audience. <laughs>